Okay. So I was looking into some stuff on Sir Francis Bacon, who lived around the turn of the 17th century, when I came upon another Brit, okay, an Irishman by birth, named Francis Bacon. He was a 20th century painter. He was, as some people I know like to say, messed up, but not unhappily so. He was very openly gay, and he claimed, I think he liked to claim, that he was sexually attracted to his father. He liked to shock people with his paintings and by saying things like that. I think he believed that if you didn't shock people, you weren't getting through, and he could be right about that. So he was a shocker. He said that the turning point in his life came on a day when he was a young man, 17, and he saw some dog shit on the pavement. That upset him for several months until he decided that it was a proper summation of life itself. We are born and we die and that's it. That's all of it. Everything that happens in between is a distraction, an individual's way of dealing with what is stark, terrible, and inevitable, violent and abominable. That's life. That reminds me of Jean-Paul Sartre, who, if I recall this rightly, took some LSD or mescaline anyway, got high, and stared at tree roots, and the sight of that so revolted him that he wrote a book called Nausea and subsequently wrote other huge tomes describing a philosophy called existentialism, in which there is birth, being, death, and nothing more. The painter Bacon, he said painting gave him something to do before he died was fascinated by the mouth, that ca carnivorous portal which can bite, kiss, speak, chew, sing, and swallow. In particular, a book he found, an illustrated medical volume on diseases of the mouth. A screaming mouth had a special allure for him, and he liked to paste that on divert versions he made of Velazquez's famous portrait of Pope Innocent X. He liked meat, carcasses of raw meat. They expressed the horror of life as well as the dog shit. He liked gambling, and in his work he also favored the operation of chance. The art of it was in knowing when the accident was right, when it gave him what he wanted. He liked to paint from photographs, starting with Edward Moybridge's studies of motion and stills from the movie Battleship Potemkin, especially the nurse screaming on the Odessa steps, and pictures of friends which he would bend, fold, spindle, and mutilate, and then make a painting of that. Crucifixion also drew his attention for several ghastly reasons and led to a triptych which was considered his first masterpiece. Margaret Thatcher once said of him, Oh, he's the man who makes those dreadful paintings. Exactly. And one of those works was sold for over $140 million. You can judge for yourself what you think of his paintings by looking it up. Something also noteworthy. I said he was messed up, and I don't think he'd disagree. I think he'd say that life itself is pretty messed up. And if you took a good look, if you took a good look at it. His studio in London, where he worked for many years, was also messed up. Cataclysmically so, and I think he liked it that way, too. It was a host of accidents waiting to happen. Someone had the sense to take it all apart, including the ceiling, floor, and walls, collect all the contents, and create an exact reconstruction of the room at a gallery in Dublin, where Bacon was born. His nearby living quarters were neat, quaintly so, almost monastic, not the studio. It was a mess, an enormous, sprawling, heaving, filthy, cluttered mess. And because it was his mess, it has a fascination of its own. An artist's studio is his boiler room. It's also his den, his playpen, his comfort zone. It's also his prison, his chapel, and his padded cell. It's his Walden his Los Alamos. Bacon's studio looks like a tidal wave or a glacier smashed through and then receded. It is a literal stream, maybe even a scream, at least a shout, of consciousness, unfiltered. 
stacks and piles of sketches, pictures, articles, cans of brushes, buckets of paint, a huge dump of things that caught his eye, causing him to think of something else and something else, chasing after that elusive thing that might be more than a mere distraction, that might be close to something that is true, that might, with a bit of luck, result in a dreadful painting.